In terms of key principles, I just want to give you a quote from um, the work that has emerged from this huge study by Strand and Murphy. And for me, if anybody said to me, Manny, which is, if you had to name a sentence amongst all this stuff, this is the one I would go for. This variable, talk about the definition of EAL in terms of the school sentence, needs to be interpreted with some caution as it is not a measure of the pupil's fluency in English. The definition, and it's their italics, not mine, gives no indication of a student's proficiency in the English language. It is important that this is recognised. This, for me, goes to the heart of many of the issues we have grappled with for the last 30 or 40 years. Okay, so when we look at profic proficiency in the AL, there are two questions we could ask. They're probably the same question, I'm not sure. We can ask what are the gaps which need to be developed, or we can talk about what are the linguistic resources do my learners need to achieve X. Okay, so we have lots of research that tells us the differences between EAL and non-EAL, and um, we have the worker principally Lynn Cameron to thank for that. And these are just some of the things that emerge from the Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 4 study. So things around vocabulary, things about the need to develop particular aspects of grammar, complex sentences, adjectives, modal verbs, adverbs and adverbials, and particularly the position of the adverb and the adverbial in the sentence. Okay? So we're familiar with a lot of this stuff. Okay? And obviously the whole minefield of metaphorical, figurative, and idiomatic language. Okay, let's have a look at a, a year five uh, pupil. Jane the girl was looking at her cat James, but then she saw a drink on the table. She was think, how will put that there? Then she was a bit thrash, I think she means thirsty. She stole to drink. Jane had a small feeling in her middle and her body was staring to get small and small and she got more and more small but she was the size of her cat James. James was get off the chair and looking at poor Jane, Jane run and run. And here we see many of the features, I'm sure you rec you'd recognise this writing as fairly typical of stuff you've had to deal with. And here we have many of the features picked up by Lynn Cameron. Uh, we can talk about line one, um, the uh, inaccurate conjunction at the end but then when it could be when. We can look at line two and also towards the end of the text, issues around the use of the past continuous tense. Uh, there's also issues with idiomatic and formulaic phrases. So she was thinking how we'll put that there. She was wondering how, as a kind of a formulaic phrase. And you've also got here, Jane had a feeling in her lines four and five, and her body was, is she talking about butterflies in the stomach? Uh, a feeling in the pit of the stomach? I'm not sure. And then, of course, we've got a real bugbear in terms of EAL learners, which is the use of comparatives when we look at line six. Yeah, she got more and more small. Okay? So I think we would all recognise this from this primary pupil as very typical features. Let's now look at the big picture. Okay? And what I mean by the big picture is how EAL has traditionally been conceptualised in large parts of the UK uh, over many years. And traditionally, we've kind of looked at it like this. We talk about a beginning phase, an emerging phase, a developing phase, and a consolidating phase. And I think whether we have or we haven't, you really do need to split beginners up into the literate and the non-literate, absolutely essential, whether it's primary or secondary. One of the things that's been missing, colleagues, from many fluency scales is the need to attend to vocabulary. However you articulate your fluency scale, maybe you should be thinking in terms of, at the beginner non-literate, going for the first 300 high frequency words, and then at the beginning English level, before they emerge from that, that they are reasonably secure in the first 1,000, and then at the emerging into the developing phase that we look at the 2,000 high frequency words, we certainly need a commitment to introducing the academic word list, both in upper primary and in secondary, 
around the emerging developing phase and being absolutely explicit about these things. And you know, if you want to do well at GCSE, you kind of need to be pretty good with the first 5,000 high frequency words. Vocabulary size matters. It really matters. Now, what this graph tells us, at the bottom you have got words known, vocabulary size, okay? And then the upper axis is dealing with percentage of text covered that the vocabulary size gives you. First, 1,000 high frequency words. If your students or pupils are fairly au okay with this level, then you're giving them approximately 74% access to most text they're going to get in school. Okay? You go up to the 2,000 word level, you're looking at 79%. One other interesting fact, if you then marry secure knowledge of the first 2,000 high frequency words with a secure knowledge of the academic word list, you are now giving your students close to 90% coverage of a lot of academic texts. What the graph also tells you is that there's a tail off after the first 2,000. And what it's telling you is this, that you can do a lot of work around the first 2,000 through, for instance, graded reading schemes, as an example, okay? Which are premised on vocabulary frequency, okay? You can do a lot of work with those, but it becomes trickier afterwards because of simply the level of the words. How many? How do we know a lot of this? Well, we have a lot of research from people like Lynn Cameron. We know her for the work on syntax, etc., etc., but she wrote a brilliant paper in 2002 <coughs> where uh, she did some studies. She, looked, she used the vocabulary levels tests with students aged 13 to 14 at, the, at different levels, 2,000, 3,000, etc. And majority of the pupils that she worked with were born uh, UK bilingual pupils. Here's an example of a receptive word recognition test at 2,000 word level. Okay? Just to give you a flavour, you get the idea. There are productive tests as well, where you've got to fill in the gaps. Okay? What did she find? Receptive and Caribbean students who had been educated through English for 10 years had gaps in the most frequent words and serious problems at the 5K level. She says the explanation may lie in the nature of the learning environment of EAL and the possible lack of focus support provides for vocab development. In the EAL situation, vocabulary coverage is not planned but it arises from teaching in curriculum areas. You know, so, you know, period one, I'm in science, period two, I'm in history, and that's how it is. Just talk to mainstream teachers as well. Intervention by mainstream subject teachers in vocabulary may often be limited to simplification of unfamiliar words, rather than attending to the need to increase vocabulary size or develop deep world knowledge. And now what I want to do is talk about what I call compass points in terms of local fluency scales. I've taken one phase, it's impossible in the time allowed to, do, to give two phases justice, but I will reference primary here, okay? So, first of all, I take my big picture. I took a local fluency scale, which has been used in over 60 schools in a particular part of the southeast of England for many, many years. It's provided the ability to have a dialogue between mainstream teachers and EAL support staff in their schools and give them a common language, okay? And they operate a fairly similar system to this, a beginning level, an emerging, a developing, a consolidating. Okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. Okay? The moment you marry this local fluency scale to compass points, other measures, like IELTS, the Common European Framework, or the new GCSC criteria, you get a concertina effect you suddenly get a big squashing of developing and emerging, okay, and you suddenly get a big widening of the issues around advanced learners of English, the consolidating area. Okay, now, these are the new GCSE grades from 9 to 1, okay? Uh, 9 is possibly wrong on this slide. I believe it could now be beyond A star. And AA star is 8 and 7, I think. I may be right in saying but you just need to take that and pinch the sort and check it here, okay? However, what's happened is this. When these came out in the summer, and I spoke to uh, Heads of English and other people, their sense is that the, the new grade five 
could well be, as our colleague mentioned this morning in the opening presentation, could be the new PISA equivalent. <coughs> okay? We know they've upped the game. The bar's been raised by the government, okay, with massive implications for EAL learners. And a four on the new GCSE bands is likely to look at a, a just, just a slight, just, just a C minus, just got the C. So we'll wait to see which one of these is going to be uh, the one that we're all kind of measured by, if you see what I mean. Okay? We also know that the top end, I think the A star A, there will be a percentage that will get it and then there's a knockdown effect. Okay? So this is what we think is going to happen. Now, here's the interesting thing. Um, as an EAL teacher for many years in school, getting my students to university, I knew that the rough equivalent that they were looking for in IELTS as the English uh, grade at university was 6.5 to 7.5. I also know this as an external examiner for MA courses in English, that they want the students to be between 6.5 and 7.5 on IELTS. Now, this is where the new GCSE grades sit, I think. Now, the six in IELTS, universities will take students who have got the six, which I think is kind of a C minus C type grade, okay? We can see how this is working out. But in some universities, for some courses, you know, the student has to commit for the first academic term to do um, a, a kind of an academic writing course, yeah, to top up their English, to put it crudely. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, okay. And the other point to mention here about compass points is that certainly NASIA, I think, should be um, commended for the work they've done in at least trying to reference the work they've done to a compass point, to an, ex an external scale like the CEFR. So I think that's, you know, that's good. Okay? But there are other issues there that I won't go into. Okay? Can we cross-reference band descriptors? Well, we can at the top end of grade 8, no question. This is the new GCSE, as we got it in the summer term, okay? Um, communicate with impact and influence, ambitious accomplished well structure. This is an A grade, A star, yeah? And look at the last line, spelling, punctuation and grammar, virtually error free. That's what we're looking at. IELTS at grade eight, okay? Manages all aspects of cohesion well, and look at the last sentence, makes only very occasional errors. CFR, one simple bold statement, present a case with an effective logical structure. Well, you ain't gonna do that if you're not doing the stuff above, I would guess, okay? So we can easily put C2 up there alongside the A in GCSE and the 8 in IELTS, okay? Grade five writing, now this we think is gonna be the new standard, okay? Communicate effectively, sustaining reader interest, coherent or structured purple text, varied sentence structures, etc etc punctuation grammar is accurate with occasional errors now grade two writing possibly nudging towards old level three here i think communicate simply with some clarity for the reader produce text with basic structures show some control over sentence type using familiar vocab etc okay now here's where we hit the buffers if you thought that was hard enough okay look at grade five reading understand implicit meanings support their understanding via their wider reading, okay? They've upped the game on reading. And primary colleagues, key implications, knock down from GCSE to primary, especially since we know that one of, I think, the widest attainment gap at Key Stage 2 is reading. 